What does Ivan IV reply when asked about his nickname? I don't want to say it, it's terrible. <laughs> Hi, welcome to Russian History of Russia. My name is Asya. So, what was so terrible about Ivan IV? Well, actually not that much. I mean, he sure wasn't perfect and quite a lot of terrible things did happen during his rule, but monarchs have gone down in history as greats for rules less successful and more bloody than his was, at least a part of it. What we're actually dealing with here is one ruler's celebrity image lost in translation. So today we are talking about the life and the rule of Ivan IV of Russia, figuring out whether or not it was really that terrible or maybe just a little bit great, and how his politics shaped the newborn empire. It's big. It's cold, it's full of gas and gold It's 1200 years old, but still never does as told We're Christians, but not really Europeans But from Asia, we send the dogs to space And kill the Tsars on occasion We drink sodas made from bread, eat our enemies in Kasha And that's why it's so fun to study history of Russia So, in Russian, Ivan's nickname is Grozny and the word grozny, even in the modern Russian language, does not mean terrible, more like formidable and strict. And in the times of Ivan, it was connected to the idea of justice, or even God's judgment, absolute and fair, even if strict. And the first ruler that we know of that this adjective was attributed to in folklore was not even Ivan IV, but his grandfather Ivan III, who ultimately went down in history as great. His contemporaries clearly saw a connection between these two figures and meant this nickname more as a positive monarchical assessment, not denunciation. The whole terrible thing happened when foreigners from Europe visited Russia and provided this translation for his nickname, which spread into French, Italian, Polish and German sources and became ubiquitous outside of Russia. Also, the Old English meaning of the word actually wasn't bad either, but more like powerful and fear-inspiring, so kind of close to the Russian version. There is, however, also a possibility that those foreigners saw the worst side of Ivan's rule during their visit, and it wasn't just an honest mistake. Either way, the word terrible does not match the original meaning, nor does it fairly reflect the whole of his rule. Nevertheless, in any history, historiography, Ivan IV is a very controversial historical figure. He is described as both an intelligent, forward-thinking, even progressive empire builder and as a petty, revengeful, cruel, and paranoid tyrant, all of which is not really that mutually exclusive. So let's unpack that. Ivan certainly had a traumatic childhood, losing both his parents pretty young and growing up watching the boyars ripping each other apart, both politically and on occasion physically, and quite likely mistreated himself. Actually, he was pretty lucky to survive and be crowned at all. So as a child, he saw the absolute worst side of corruption by power and greed, and that certainly would have influenced his personality and future Future decisions. After the untimely death of Ivan's mother and the regent Yelena Glinska in 1538, two influential Bayar families got their interchanging grip on power that lasted till the end of the 40s. They and their buddies spent that time by reinventing corruption on a whole new level. Since the nobles still received their estates and positions directly from the ruler, the first Thing each clan would do upon taking power was, of course, enriching their supporters and relatives. Those, in return, feeling particularly impunity-free, often behaved pretty tyrancy towards their respective estates. They would come up with new ways to squeeze out as much wealth in the time they had, since the political situation was very unstable, or because they had waited in line to get the estate for too long. And 
and were feeling a bit impatient. These new owners went through all the classics. Unlawful made-up taxation, free work, ungrounded arrests that allowed them to claim the property of the arrested or demand heavy fines, and even collusion with the local crime. Man, five centuries have passed, how does all this stuff still sound so familiar? One of the biggest issues was that the local noble was both feeding off the serving classes and had full judicial power over them. Really unhappy about this situation, lower classes, with surprising support from the clergy, had been pushing for the transfer of this power to local communities. So separate social classes, like peasants, began establishing their own governing representatives and courts to settle local matters and pushing against the landlord's mayhem. In the 40s, these tensions reached the tipping point and led to a giant uprising and a riot in Moscow in 1547, just months after Ivan's coronation. The crowd targeted Ivan's mother's side of the family, Polish nobles Glinskie, their estate was attacked and his uncle murdered and his body displayed in the city square. The riots also followed a massive Moscow fire of 1547 that destroyed a large part of the city. These events disillusioned the young Tsar and the ruling classes. The necessity of reforms was now obvious to most, and a new unofficial body was formed from the Bayars and church leaders closest to Ivan, called Izbrane Rada, the Council of the Chosen Ones. With their support and advice, Ivan IV began his role as a progressive modernizer and a peaceful reformist, focused on building social and government institutions and de-escalating social tensions. Ivan created sort of departments of the government, prototypes for future ministries. He also reformed the government's relationship with the church and asked a lot of uncomfortable questions about church's lands and practices that led to the creation of Staglav, the Book of 100 Chapters, that regulated a lot of operational policies of the church. In 1549, he established Zemsky Sabor, basically sort of a parliament that had representatives from all classes, except, of course, the peasants, which made Ivan's tsardom kind of a representative monarchy. This was pretty handy after his death, because a succession crisis is coming, and spoiler alert, Ivan IV is going to be the last of Rurik dynasty on the Russian throne. But in the 1550s, the future seemed really bright. Ivan published a new code of law in the 1550, that standardized tax collection even further, limited peasants' freedoms, but at the same time transferred judicial and some other authorities to them, which is pretty much what they had been asking for for quite some time. The same year, a bunch of Pomeshiki received lands around Moscow and formed the core of Russia's first regular army, which, get this, had actual guns. In general, Ivan seems to be quite welcoming when it comes to the new technologies of his age. In 1553, he established the first Moscow printing yard, you know, the same technology that led to the Reformation in Europe. Naturally, the Orthodox Church was not particularly psyched about this one, and one day it burned down. However, it was rebuilt in the 60s, and from that moment on, print existed in Russia. He was also a big supporter of trade and craftsmanship. The northern city port of Arkhangelsk on the White Sea exists because of the British Muscovy Company, to which Ivan granted exclusive trade privileges and basically built that port just for them. Through that exchange, he also engaged in a correspondence with Queen Elizabeth I, seeking military alliance of some sort while she was politely trying to stick to the subject of commerce. Ivan was clearly trying to overcome this invisible wall between his young empire and more established monarchies in the West. His title as a Tsar was important here, 
it translated into an emperor in the European hierarchy, while the previous titles of grand princes were just translated into dukes. Ivan wanted his tsardom to be taken seriously and have weight. It took some convincing and time, but he did get most of Europe's official recognition of his new title and status. And that, of course, took some warring to do. On the East Front, he still had some state entities' remnants of the Tatar-Mongol Empire to deal with. In 1552, the capital of Kazan Khanate, Moscow's longtime adversary, fell. To commemorate this victory, Ivan IV commissioned a construction of a highly unusual cathedral that still awes to this day. It is commonly known as St. Basil's Cathedral, located on Moscow's Red Square, and it is arguably the most recognizable symbol of the city around the world. Ivan's goal was occupying the Volga River artery, and overcoming local pushback here and in his Astrakhan Khanate campaign was not easy at all, even with more advanced army and weapons. Religious differences with majority of the population here being Muslim sure didn't help. However, Ivan's policy that allowed conquered men to serve in his army and even relocate closer to Moscow sure did. Ultimately, his conquest was quite successful. In 1556, the capital of the Golden Horde, Sarai Batu, was destroyed and Russia Russia's rule stretched all the way from Caucasus to the Barents Sea. In the later 50s, Ivan is dragged into wars on the Western Front. First with Sweden, who was kind of upset about the whole new northern trade with the British deal. Then with Livonia, who wouldn't let the European trading ships into another new Russian port built on the Narva River. Both wars were originally quite successful for Ivan leading to a peace treaty with Sweden and essentially destruction of Livonian order. Although he failed to capitalize on his victory and many lands were grabbed by Denmark, Poland, Lithuania, and Sweden and led to another war that lasted 24 years. From that moment on, direct Baltic trade becomes one of the pillars of the Russian state and the reason for a really long rivalry with Sweden. So, here we are, 13 years in, so far so good. Successful reforms, profitable wars. If Ivan IV had died in the 1560, they would have certainly had to come up with another version of a great nickname for him. But he didn't, and everything changed. In the 1560, his wife, Anastasia, died, seemingly poisoned. Ivan must have actually liked his wife a lot, or maybe was poisoned too, because that's the time that some of the first signs of his personality changing can be traced to. To make matters worse, one of his closest allies from the Chosen Council turned against him, fled to Lithuania, and even attacked one of the Russian provinces with Lithuanian army. The the relationship with the Chosen Council was quickly souring. Ivan was becoming increasingly paranoid and stopped trusting any of his advisors. And soon this paranoia spread on all of Bayar's and high-ranking landowners as potential threats to his monarchy and autocracy. Which brings us to the state policy that Ivan IV is probably most famous for. Aprichnina, a period of terror and oppression that, according to some historians, landed him a cozy spot on the top three tier of Russian tyrants, somewhere between Stalin and Peter the Great. How and why Aprichnina happened, however, is something that we're going to talk about in the next episode. Thank you for watching. Bye.